the viewer question is based on lack of knowledge that the COMEX does not deliver gold. So why would you think that it's possible to pay the official price, which is heavily discounted and suppressed, in the COMEX and walk away with your gold when nobody has walked away with gold at the COMEX for over three years? The COMEX is not a market of gold. It's a market of paper. Paper with the word gold, G-O-L-D, printed on it. There's no delivery of gold at the COMEX. Next question. This viewer wants to know, when major banks start to default, do you see J.P. Morgan push to revalue silver upward and use their silver stockpile as leverage to buy up and consolidate other bankrupt entities? No, because the J.P. Morgan paper stockpile, I believe, was used to facilitate delivery of gold to China. It doesn't mean that... that uh, don't confuse paper silver with paper with, with physical silver. Don't confuse paper gold with physical gold. Okay, JP Morgan has a stack of silver in the form of paper. That's not metal. They used it to facilitate the delivery of metal to China. They're also falsifying their paper silver accounting, mixing it in with the paper and physical copper accounting to produce falsified paper silver accounting that's confusing the hell out of a lot of people. JP Morgan does not have a lot of silver. I'm referring to metal. They can't use it to diffuse anything because they don't have the metal. They have paper contracts. Paper is not metal. There's no delivery of gold or silver at the COMEX for three years of the metal. It's a paper factory. It's a paper mill. It's a corrupt paper arena. All right, next, next question. Mike Riley is wanting to know, in regard to COMEX activities, why would the small specs, quote-unquote small specs, continue to be washed out and rinsed by the large commercials? Don't they ever learn? How do these hedge funds stay in business? I thought the COMEX would be deemed irrelevant by now due to the obvious rigging. Was it H.L. Mencken said that there's a, a fool born every day or something to that effect? How many times do we hear, well, this time is different? I remember I got into an argument. I'll never forget I was living, I remember exactly where I was living and talking. I talked to Bill Murphy, and he told me in around June of 2012 that J.P. Morgan was going to get shut down and, and hauled on the carpet for their, by the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Bill Murphy got, got into a big argument with me, uh, telling me that J.P. Morgan was going to be hauled on the carpet, brought up for charges of fraud and, and malfeasance and rigging the market and you name it with respect to gold and silver. How'd that turn out? Um, I told Bill that he was crazy. Uh, I've got people tell me all the time that the comics price is the real price. And I say, well, are you aware that every few months they sell like, like half a year's worth of global mining output? No, they're not aware. I mean, how do the small specs continue without getting wiped out? Well, they don't. A portion of them get wiped out, and a new portion enters the scene with fresh new money. Wall Street has a name for fresh new money. They call it paper. There's paper coming in. Paper, mean, paper coming in means there's stupid idiots who are throwing good money into the system with new lofty stupidity in their expectations. No, they don't survive. Just the fact that there's a category called small specs that's always with a certain number in the data doesn't mean it's always the same players. Some get killed. Gosh, even the owner of the Boston Red Sox he lost an enormous amount of money, like a hundred million dollars. And he exited as a small speck. 
Is he dead? No. Does he still own the Red Sox? Yeah. Does he still play in the in the futures markets? I think much less. What's the point? The point is that there always will be small specs because there will always be stupid people who think the market will return to legitimacy and seek a fair equilibrium. I don't. I think that fair equilibrium will come only when the gold standard exists because, as I said before, that is how your real, legitimate, powerful competition comes that's so powerful that it can defuse war. There will always be small specs. They will always get crushed. And I just wonder how many little firms are being created by the Wall Street crowd to confuse matters, just like they're confusing matters with the alt news. There are a number of websites now by official sources uh, in order to muddy the water. So I, even with the small specs versus large commercials, there, there's some confusion in there. I, I stopped paying real close attention to the commitment of traders a few years ago because it was, it was either the same story being repeated with a three to four to six month cycle and a crush of the small specs, or it was confusion in the data. And we saw a lot of confusion in the data with respect to the large Wall Street ban banks. It was Citigroup, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Bank of America. They were just shifting gold around uh, in their inventories and hiding it in various places in order to muddy the waters on even the COMEX inventory. So all the data is being messed up in a way that all the markets are rigged. It's getting very, very confusing out there. And uh, <clears throat> there was a mention of, of the $2,100 paid for gold. Yes, that was an actual example. It was something on the order of $150 million uh, trade done in Dubai. I have only a little bit of extra data on that transaction, but uh, I was on orders not to reveal. But I saw a picture of the big bin. There were a huge batch of 10 kilogram gold bars. And uh, if you want to find the, the true price in a market, try to make a large sale. Try to make a large purchase. And you find out what's really going on. Okay, I've had, I want to be balanced here. I've had a couple of, of clients and followers tell me that uh, there are New York sources uh, where dealers could provide um, a few million dollars worth of gold at the existing COMEX price without a giant premium, you know, maybe a standard small premium like under five percent and you know that's all well and good but uh, I haven't seen any pictures of it and I don't know the broker for the sales whereas the Dubai, Dubai sale I do know the quantity I do know the source and I do know the broker so again for someone to say to me well gee Jim you know it's still possible in New York well that's all fine but I don't know who the broker was I don't know what the volume was I don't know who the buyer was and I don't know what the source was I mean if someone tells me that there's a you know a 20 million dollar gold sale in New York at, at spot plus a couple percent I, I'd probably say I think you're lying I'd, I'd probably say I think your story's not true all right moving on here now, recently, Puerto Rico announced bankruptcy, and this viewer is wanting to know how that could possibly impact the United States, if at all. In two ways, I think it will impact. Um, the first way is their bonds are backed by the U.S. government in the form of treasury bonds. We're talking about, I think, $80 billion. Okay, they're backed by the U.S. government. 
Now, why would that be? They're not in the United States. Well, they're a U.S. protectorate. It, it's not like, say, uh, oh, let's just say Panama offers a, uh, a bond in dollar denomination. That wouldn't necessarily be backed by the U.S. government in the form of treasure bond. That's not the same structural setup. Puerto Rico <coughs> set this up with the full blessing of the U.S. government and the full backing using their debt security instrument, the Treasury bond. Okay, so if there's a default, uh, that would maybe have fallout <clears throat> to either the Treasury bonds that exist or to the banks that hold them in unclear ways. I don't know. This is a mystery. We, this is without precedent. This is what we often call uncharted waters. Okay, here's the second way. Pardon me. <coughs> a little water <coughs> went down the wrong tube. The second way is that the major investors for the Puerto Rican bonds are Wall Street banks and hedge funds. I should say hedge funds with a lot of Wall Street bank cooperation. By that I mean hedge funds who have some borrowed money from Wall Street banks. So they're in it together. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. These hedge funds have been pressuring in very powerful ways the uh, what, do you, what do you call the trustee in Puerto Rico to hold the line on value, not to force write downs, and in, in essence, not to permit the Wall Street entities, the hedge funds, from losing money. And they held their ground pretty well until about a month ago. And then suddenly, looks like the trustee, with very coincidentally, a new governor of Puerto Rico, they stepped in and said, we have a solution. The new group said, we have a solution for the Puerto Rican bankruptcy. We're going to do a restructure, and we're going to force a rather significant haircut on the American investors, the hedge funds backed by Wall Street. So there's going to be pressure. There's going to be possibly movements toward bribery, maybe a kidnapping. Who knows? Wall Street's capable of all. Um, but we're going to see some impact. Okay, remember what happened in the energy sector. The oil price went down. Energy firms went bust, both shale and conventional. And Wall Street portfolios took a massive hit. <clears throat> if they write down... 60 of 80 billion from Puerto Rican debt, that would be bigger than the write down for the entire energy sector on the Wall Street portfolio. So that puts it into perspective. <clears throat> the impact from Puerto Rico could be on Wall Street portfolios with respect to hedge funds that go under. Imagine five big hedge funds, well, connected to Wall Street, take huge hits, a couple fail, and suddenly you have a story that a couple Wall Street banks are in bigger trouble now than they were with their energy portfolios. Okay, what I'm trying to say is that Puerto Rico might be bigger than the energy impact to Wall Street portfolios. Well, at the same time, Eli, putting a tarnish on the Treasury bond. Okay, if they, if they do a write-down, it would be a write-down on the Treasury bond. Okay, this is very important. It's the Treasury bond and the Wall Street banks. A Puerto Rican default would be a default of the Treasury bond. Now, will the United States government step in and say, we can't allow any write-down on the Treasury bond because that would be a bad precedent. We're going to honor it all and have a QE to back it all up. Well, that might happen. And what would that do? What would that accomplish? It would bail out the Wall Street clients, the hedge funds. Another dirty insider move. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh -huh. A potential bailout. Um, I, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But whatever it is, it's going to be ugly and dirty and have impact.
All right, this viewer is wanting to know, will the collapse of the petrodollar end the suppression of the metals prices? Okay, well, let's back up. Um, how about a different question? Has the petrodollar been dismantled already? We're not seeing the petrodollar uh, enter a new phase where it's being challenged. We're seeing the third year of the dismantling of the petrodollar in progress, very close to a climax event of the funeral. So to ask whether the, the end of the petrodollar will bring an end to the gold price suppression, that's a bit off the mark even in the question. Um, we haven't had any end to gold price suppression in the last couple of years while the petrodollar has been dying and being dismantled. By that I mean look at the look at the oil price. In the last 18 months it's gone from 100 to $50 and now it's even under $50 again. Is there any, th that is the dismantling of the petrodollar right there. The, gold, the, 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 the oil price had been cut in half or more, like 50 to 60 percent, and there had been a climax of the gold price suppression. Okay, here's what I think will be the final event for the, uh, what I call the funeral of, of the petrodollar. I think it will be when the Saudis announce that they accept RMB currency from China or any Asian nation like Korea for the Saudi gold, uh, Saudi oil. So Saudi oil sales paid for in the form of Chinese RMB currency. It's not out of the question that a Southeast Asian smaller country would pay in RMB for oil from the Saudis or any other Gulf region uh, monarchy. So <clears throat> we're not about to see the beginning of the petrodollar death. We're seeing the conclusion in a three-year process. It, it didn't come to form for 40 years in usage and have a risk of, of say, being dismantled in a month or two. It's a, it's a multi-year process. It, it's hard to say exactly when this petrodollar is done, uh, it, it's, we don't have announcements to say, oh, the petrodollar is being challenged. Oh, the petrodollar is being dismantled for all its derivatives. Oh, the petrodollar is, is seeing liquidation in giant trillion dollar contracts. We don't get news like that. You have to piece it together and make inferences, and that's what the Hattrick letter has done. Uh, that's how, how we've been reporting, how I've been reporting, and, and how Others in, in my, among, among my group of colleagues have been helping me to understand some of the very difficult elements. I think the liquidation of the derivatives tied to currencies, major currencies, and oil have been in progress, this grand liquidation since 2014. Okay, when the Chinese are given permission to buy, say, Saudi oil and other Gulf Emirate oil, paid for in RMB, I think you're, you're not even then going to see an end to the gold price suppression. What it's going to take is two things, and I've been very consistent on this for over a year in the message. We need to see the gold trade note used instead of the treasury bill, the dollar, in trade payment, starting in oil, moving to container vessels, moving to cargo shipments of commodities, and lastly moving to international, say, consulting contracts, like with, say, India and a nation in the Middle East for information technology for healthcare, something like that, international consulting contracts. Unless you see the gold trade note push aside the Treasury bill in trade payment, you're still going to see the king dollar throwing its weight around, including in the gold market. The second requirement is you need to see 
in banking systems across a wide group of countries, like 30, 40, 80 countries, where they sell their treasury bonds and replace them with gold, gold bars, for a more legitimate basis and asset core for their banking systems. When you see gold trade notes and trade and gold bullion and bank reserves, you will then see far less in the way of gold price suppression at the COMEX and LBMA. In fact, you will see you will see an eruption in the U.S. landscape because they must then launch a new dollar. And they might try to delay that. I'm hearing, this is a kind of an interesting side, aside, but I'm hearing that there's a very strong chance of, of a dual universe. And we're evolving into this direction where the West, namely North America, parts of South America, and uh, uh, United Kingdom, and Western Europe, and, and scattered other countries like Japan, would be using the dollar in trade and banking. But the rest of the world, led by Russia and China, the BRICS nations, emerging market nations, and a whole lot of other nations, they would be using the RMB, the Chinese currency. So this dual universe would be the dollar versus the RMB. And where it would get dicey and very different suddenly would be when the RMB is backed by gold. And you might have, say, an interchangeable gold trade note with, say, a short-term RMB bill, like a treasure bill, but RMB bill, used for trade, backed by gold, and a gold trade note, the formal note, might be interchangeable with this Chinese RMB bill for trade purposes. Okay, I think the, when the dual universe is bigger, namely when the the volume of the RMB trade is twice what it is now or three times what it is now, that's when you're going to say, well, we really do have a dual universe. It, it's really East versus West, dollar versus RMB. It, it's going that direction, Eli, but, but everything will change suddenly uh, for this dual universe when the East adopts gold for banking and trade purposes, and then the dollar will not be able to compete. So, uh, very messy, and I think this petrodollar, it's very hard to say the petrodollar even exists right now. It's very hard to make an argument that there's any evidence of the petrodollar's existence. W where is it evident? Uh, well, there's still cargo vessels of oil and they're paid for with treasure bills. Well, yeah, <clears throat> but the mechanisms linking the dollar to oil are pretty much all wrecked when the oil price went way below 100 and stayed there for several months. When it stayed there for several months, it ruined all the petrodollar derivatives all the contract linkage between, say, the British pound, the euro, and the dollar, and its connection to oil. They've all been pretty much wrecked. All right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up the viewers' questions. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where they can find you online? Last thoughts. Well, the big, the big, theme, the big theme this month for me is uh, issues regarding Japan. We have a tumult. A tumult. Uh, we have vast controversy going on in Japan. We have a change of the guard going on in Japan. We have the U.S. puppet in Shinzo Abe going out. We have prices rising in Japan. Uh, we have a rather evident linkage now between the gold price and the Japanese currency, the yen. It's a very tight linkage. And it, it's been truly amazing in the last 12 months. I would say that the correlation is on the order of 80 to 90 percent. In the last three months, the correlation might be greater than 90 percent. I mean the yen currency versus gold. 
uh, actually the dollar in yen terms versus spot gold. I'm looking at a chart right now, and, and, and they're, they're like right on top of each other, the blue curve and the red curve. And, and it really wasn't much different before December going all the way back to July. Okay, If we're seeing some massive changes in the governmental structure of Japan, we might see some rather significant changes in their central bank policy. This is a very big story because it might possibly be what breaks the gold market. The other big story is that it seems like every financial market is teetering toward collapse. <clears throat> um, I, I really don't regard North Korea as anything important. Another big, big story is Venezuela. Um, I'm going to be covering these major stories in the May report, and I've already started collecting, you know, a couple dozen pages of notes toward the reports uh, being written. Uh, but the Venezuelans <coughs> have a new problem in that their military protectors, you know, they try to bring in uh, these, you know, 20-something-year-old men from other provinces to come in and protect the palace so that if they're shooting anybody in the public, they're not shooting their brother or their cousin because they're in a different province from where they come from. Well, now you're starting to see uh, defections from within the Venezuelan military. They're, they're, they're not holding their positions. They're not sticking around. They're, they're leaving their, their, their jobs in the military. So. It's turned very violent. We've had some armored cars run over people. We've had a lot of Molotov cocktails of official. Anyway, what I'm pointing to is that we knew we have a, a higher level of violence pointing toward armed revolt, violent revolt in Venezuela. This could be very significant. Uh, other major stories, hard to say. I, th this China situation... Okay, there's a lot of press reports in the West that the Chinese have a lot of debt problems. They've created too much money. Their credit is way out of sight. And what, what, this, what this is for is to mask how the United States has the same problems tenfold. What they don't like to mention is the Chinese can handle these problems with their $3 trillion in reserves. I should quantify that better. They've got the equivalent of $3 trillion in Forex reserves denominated in a number of different uh, asset forms, $1 trillion of which is Treasury bonds. What they also don't like to mention, in other words, China can handle a lot of its own problems. What they also don't like to mention is that China has something on the order of 25 or 30,000 tons of gold with which to handle any crisis that unfolds, and clearly they have one unfolding. How much gold tonnage does the United States have? Zero. So we have tenfold the same problems as China, but without any gold reserves and without any forex reserves. We could say, well, gee, the Federal Reserve's got, got $4 trillion worth of Treasury bonds. That's sort of a quasi-reserve fund, is it not? No, it's not. If they dump it, they'll wreck the dollar, so they don't dump it. In fact, there are no buyers of treasury bonds, so the Fed, despite their words, continues to accumulate more. They're not dumping, they're buying more and lying. So these are the major stories right now um, that I'm following. Uh, there are surely more. I, I think a big story emerging right now is, is Iran. Uh, some ugly elements to the Obama nuclear trade deal. Apparently, uh, close to a billion dollars worth of that money handed to Iran. Why were they handed money? Because we illegally froze their assets in the West. And we got called on it. So Obama, I think, worked a deal where he said, and this is my conjecture, he said, well, go ahead with this deal, but you have to promise to spend like like half a billion dollars just to start in order to make the little wars bigger. 
because the United States wants wars everywhere. And Iran said, well, we could think of a couple places we'd like to have some, some war participation, like in Yemen. So Iran is using some of the U.S. money <clears throat> to buy weapons to use in the Yemen-Saudi war. Okay. At the same time, Iran is, is ratcheting up their uh, development of a, of a port facility. It, it's called Chabahar. And it's on the Gulf of Oman, which is near the Hormuz Straits, near the you know Arabian Sea. Um, and this Chabahar port is going to be used for trade with India. And what stands in the way is a few hundred miles of Pakistani coastline. Okay, so there's going to be port traffic sea lane traffic between Iran at the Chabahar port and India, but there's also going to be a railway that, that gets developed further going all the way into Afghanistan, which is a neighbor to the east of Iran and a neighbor to the west of Pakistan. So the United States is doing its usual, um, trying to get more terrorist violence in Pakistan so that it disrupts this port facility development. The main terrorist agent in the world is the United States. So, very interesting what's going on, and uh, these are some of the stories that I, I, I cover in the Hattrick letter, and uh, there, there are more. I mean, gosh, here's a little weird story <coughs> that uh, it just came my way. Pepsi Cola was involved in the 1960s decade for cocaine processing in Burma. Uh, golly, how helpful. I'm sure it helped improve the Pepsi profits at the time during the Nixon administration. So they probably had the full blessing of the Nixon administration. The United States is, in its corporate participation, is full of fraud and uh, Satanism, and you know now you see the, the the U.S. corporate influence with big pharma, half of which is owned by the Rockefellers, by the way, the ph pharmaceutical companies. That's why the vaccines are full of the actual virus and other uh, debilitating mechanisms, like to slow down your immune system and to advance cancer. That's in your vaccines. Um, you also have Monsanto spreading glyphosate and other pesticides. Are people aware that Monsanto's glyphosate is classified as an antibiotic so it can be put into vaccines? A pesticide put into vaccines? Okay, these are some of the stories, okay? And uh, they're found on the goldenjackass.com, www.goldenjackass.com. Every month there are a couple of reports. One's called the Global Money War Re Report, and that is all about the defense of the King Dollar system. I call it the King Dollar Court and its reign of terror. Empire of Chaos is the term used by the Saker. Very appropriate. So the one, <clears throat> the one report is followed by a second called the Golden Currency Report. Um, got my notes. I'm beginning this week something like 10 days or 12 days, the reports would be published, don't know exactly, but we're in the, getting toward the middle of the month, which means it's prime time for getting this report written and uh, got my progress. So I hope people go to the Golden Jackass website, bounce around, look around. There are a lot of uh, links for interviews like this. I try not to have repeat interviews unless they provide a nice workable link uh, to be sure their game is being played by YouTube and Google but uh, the alt news will prevail. Um, there are also public articles with links. I've been writing more public articles in the last few months because it seems like there's more really interesting things going on in a, in a focal point sort of way. But I invite people to go to the website and sign up for the newsletter. I, I like often to mention two of my favorite compliments. Hi, Jim. I just, I just came back to the newsletter. I was a subscriber 
years ago, and after three or four years, I thought I'd move on, but I came back to the newsletter, and I wish I'd never left. Okay, the other one is I've been listening to your podcasts like this, and I, I've just been going the free route, didn't really want to spend money on a subscription, but finally I did, curious of what it might include that's not in your interviews and your public articles, and I'm astounded that it includes so much and ties together so much with nice pictures, nice quotes, good stories, good <clears throat> analytic contributions from your jackass colleagues, and I wish I had not waited to sign up for your newsletter. So. People who left regret leaving when they come back, and people who wait regret the wait for not signing up. And that's, those are two very nice compliments, and I do get my share of uh, hate mail. Uh, it seems to have picked up, <laughs> Elijah, in, in the last three or four weeks has picked up, but it's nothing like what it was a year ago. Uh, I think I could say that sometime around Christmas it was about... 10% of what it was a year, a year and a half ago, and now it's maybe about 20% of what it was a year, a year and a half ago, picking, picking up a little bit. And, and the voice has a nice way of uh, regarding this. He said, if you weren't uh, hitting on some shrill notes and very sensitive points, uh, you wouldn't get any hate mail. So that's okay. It's kind of validation that I'm on the right track. and. Uh, so far, so good. So thanks for having me on, Elijah. It's always a pleasure.